Welcome to the Due Diligence Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. And for more than 10 years with SNN, I've been doing interviews with microcap management teams at investor conferences globally, as well as online. Our SNN Live CEO video interviews are meant to pique interest, and then one can discover more by going to that company website. But personally, I always have more questions I want to ask. On this show, I'll be chatting with public company executives from microcap companies, and we'll dive deeper into companies that are rarely profiled. Microcap traditionally is overlooked, unloved, and absolutely never featured on legacy financial media outlets unless something material is going on that's a good story. With my experience interviewing management teams, having interviewed most of them before, I've built up a network of companies, so there will be no shortage of content. Furthermore, this is an opportunity for me to showcase some of the qualitative lessons I've learned from guests on the Planet Microcap podcast. You can expect high quality interviews with management teams that may have exposure to broader macro trends that you may never have thought of. One of the many reasons why I love the microcap space. So if you love microcaps and especially love learning about companies before the professionals do, let's start our due diligence. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast. My guest on the show today is Justin Hales, CEO of Camplify Holdings Limited, publicly traded company. The symbol is CHL on the ASX. Camplify, based in Australia, is a peer-to-peer digital marketplace platform connecting recreational vehicle RV owners to hires. Camplify's platform allows for consumers and potential RV hirers to connect with RV owners and small medium enterprises with a fleet of RVs. Having grown its community in Australia, Camplify expanded its operations into the United Kingdom, New Zealand, and Spain. At the time of recording, I had recently returned from an RV trip with my kids and hoped to do more. So I was really looking forward to chatting with Justin about how Camplify's marketplace platform works and the barrier to entry launching the technology, competitive landscape for Camplify, and the current market penetration and expansion into Europe. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Justin Hales, CEO of Camplify. Welcome, everyone, to the Due Diligence Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and joining me today is Justin Hales. He's the CEO of Camplify Holdings. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is CHL on the ASX. Justin, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? Hi, Rob. Thanks for having me. Uh, Excited to do the podcast. Look forward to it. I got to tell you, the timing is perfect. Uh, we're recording this on March 14th, and uh, I actually just got back from a little uh, uh, camping trip. So, uh, well, vis-a-vis a, a trailer with with my my family and stuff. So, uh, you know, the, the timing couldn't be better. Um, right. I'm, I'm off on mine on uh, Thursday in a couple of days, so uh, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Well, let's, uh, as we alluded to a little bit just now as to what we're probably going to be talking about today, um, can you start us off with that one line that best defines Camplify? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the easiest way to explain it is it's a little bit like Airbnb, but for, you know, camper vans, uh, all different types of RVs. So uh, in Australia, we call them, you know, motorhomes, camper vans, caravans, camper trailers. In the US, you know, known as, as predominantly sort of drivable RVs and uh, and trailers. So, you know, we provide a way for both of those two parties to connect together and, and experience uh, that type of vehicle. Very good. Now, you founded the company about seven years ago. What was that? Well, I, listen, I'm sure there's folks that understand the camping industry, may have a trailer or a motorhome. They understand some of the costs involved with some of that stuff. But in, in your opinion and in your words, you know, what was the original problem Camplify was trying to solve and how has that evolved or changed over time? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, what the main reason that I kind of started that was because, uh, you know, my wife and I were. Uh, talking about going on a camping trip and she said look i would love to go camping i've never been camping but there's no way i'm staying in a tent um and i want to take our dog with us so you know why don't you go see if you can rent us a trailer and and go away uh in uh in you know for the for the weekend 
So I started looking at, you know, what was available, how to do it. And I found that really the only things that were available to rent at that stage were like big RVs and, uh, you know, trailers weren't, weren't available to rent. Um, and even those big RVs, to get them, I had to drive to an international airport to pick one up. So, you know, for, for me, that was an hour and a half drive to be able to just to get one. There was lots of rules at, in, around it. And there was just these big commercial operators who were providing that fleet. So uh, as we're sort of talking about this, you know, sort of plan a holiday every day, we're going for a walk around the neighbourhood with our dog and, uh, you know, just realised that I was walking past sort of 40 or 50 trailers parked on the side of the street uh, every day. And, you know, I thought, well, hey, it'd be great if I could just rent my neighbours. Um, and then, you know, when I started digging into it, I found out that, you know, most people who owned one of these, you know, vehicles were only using it for about four to six weeks of the year. They were spending, you know, roughly about sort of seventy to $80,000 on, on buying one. Uh, and then they had all their maintenance, storage, insurance costs on top of that. So, um, you know, it's a, it has become the really the perfect sharing economy vehicle uh, because you've got a high investment and a really low usage uh, and lots of people want to access it and want to access it in their neighborhood on demand. So, um, yeah, it's perfect for both parties. Very good. And, and before we get into the business side and the actual the tech and how it works, I mean, what was your background prior to founding Camplify? Yeah. So um, for uh, a number of years, I worked for another uh, tech company that was also listed on the Australian Australian stock market. Uh, it was a mining software company. So uh, we actually helped uh, mining companies, uh, coal mining, iron ore, gold, nickel, all those types of uh, different miners to actually replace um, spreadsheets in their planning of how they um, actually were mining the mines uh, and implement some so some software that allowed them to uh, look at quality and and uh, quantity through their processes uh, and actually do it in a more predictable way. So, um, you know, I sort of took that um, software background, that tech understanding of, you know, doing something better with tech uh, and, and implemented it into the, the vehicle sharing industry. Very good. All right. So you have the idea, you want to go on the trip, you're walking down the road, you see all these different trailers everywhere. So what, what was the, what's the first thing you do? I mean, did you go out and say, okay, this is our Airbnb, this is their infrastructure, you know, the Verbo, some of these other ones out there. Did you just tell your team like, all right, I want to build something that just like this, but for RVs and, and what, when eventually did it come onto market and you start, you know, tinkering with it? Yeah, look, it was one of those sort of perfect storm moments. Um, you know, I kind of had the idea, I had sort of about three or four different ideas and I had a whiteboard in my office and, you know, I'd go back and write these ideas in my whiteboard uh, and Camplify was one of them. And um, I, um, as I was sort of thinking about these ideas, I had an email from a, a friend of mine actually used to be, um, you know, he founded that company that I mentioned before. Um, and sort of when it was, when we were sold, uh, he went off to build an accelerator program. So, um, I had an email from him saying, hey, I'm running an accelerator program. Do you have any good ideas? I'd love to have you in the program. Uh, and then he said, oh, I'm doing this with uh, an organisation uh, in Australia, which is called the National Roads and Motoring Association, which is very similar to the, uh, the AAA in America. And so, um, you know, we're looking for ideas that are around road trips. So I went, oh, that sounds Perfect. Um, so uh, then I sort of um, you know, registered the domain. I, I, I built a very crude website. Um, I rang my brother-in-law and said, he was a software developer, and said, hey, this, I've got this idea. Um, I want to test if it works. So you know, we built some really basic forms, um, you know, uh, created sort of the logo and the, and the business name uh, and sort of started running some AdWords to see if people would sign up. Uh, and, you know, lo and behold, very quickly, we got lots of lots and lots of interest and lots of people wanting to sign up. Um, and that was in sort of the first um, kind of couple of weeks. Uh, and then we then we got invited to uh, go and you know, pitch in that, in that accelerator program. Very good. Uh, but not not to take the piss or anything, but I mean, OK, yeah, Camplify. Was it between Camplify or camping without any vowels? I, you know, we, was it, what, what, how, did, how did we get to Camplify? Yeah, just a classic techie name, I'm sure. <laughs> what I actually did was put um, a bunch of words into a um, an online uh, program that combined words together. 
<laughs> and so some of the words I put in was was like well, the two that became it was was camping and amplified. So I was like, I want it to be like a camping experience, but you know, amplified to the next level. Um, and then that's sort of where it munged together and became Camplify. So very good. All right. So let's dive a little deeper into the business itself right now. Tell us how exactly it works, how folks sign up, the, just kind of the full slate and the customer experience, both on if you want to list your camper, your RV, and then maybe folks like myself that maybe want to go and rent one. Yeah. Okay. So st- starting with the owner side, um, you know, we have, um, uh, you know, roughly, if I, I just take the Australian market as the example, and obviously we operate in, uh, you know, multiple different markets around the world now, but, um, you know, looking at Australia, so we have roughly about 800,000 people. Uh, registered RVs in, in Australia. So um, those private individuals come on our platform, uh, they fill out, answer some questions about their vehicle. Um, they look at what sort of rates they want to get, um, who their insurance provider is, uh, you know, what the rules are they want. So they can choose to either um, you know, allow people to come and actually take the vehicle away or they can actually go and set the vehicle up for people as well. And so we do a lot of setup um, as part of our uh, program where the owner will actually take the vehicle physically somewhere for you and set it up, have it all ready to go for you um, in, in line with the um, the rental. So we go through that process. Um, you know, that takes, you know, around about sort of 10 minutes to do. Um, and then uh, from that, our customer success team sort of reviews, um, you know, your um, uh, so, uh, listing that you've created. Uh, and then sort of gets in touch with you and sort of helps you with the next steps. And, you know, some of those steps might be, making sure that you've got the right um, you know, registered vehicle, making sure that you've got the right insurance. So um, insurance has become a, a big piece in what we offer. So we actually went out there and created our own insurance product um, in line with um, you know, some uh, providers in, in, the, in all the different markets we operate in. Um, and so you know, we can now offer a per day insurance uh, to that um, owner to make sure they're fully covered. Um, or a permanent insurance product. So someone who wants to rent out, you know, in a more uh, frequency can choose that permanent uh, cover. And so we, we work through those options and provide that information to the uh, customer. We take them through sort of the terms and conditions and, um, you know, how to set up their vehicle and make sure they understand what they need to do to provide it in a safe environment. Uh, and then, you know, once they've gone through that onboarding process, they're listed on the platform, uh, and they're ready to go to be able to take their first rental. Got it. What, what's sorry? I know we're going to get to the the user side in a second, but what's the time that it takes? Let's say I want to do this tomorrow. Like how how long does that onboarding process take? Yes, yeah, so the whole thing from start to finish, you know, probably takes around about an hour. Um, so it's oh, pretty wow. quick. Okay. Um, I think our record from completing that process to first booking uh, is twenty seconds. So. Um, you know, sort of an hour plus 20 seconds to get your first booking roughly. So yeah, it's pretty good. That's, that's pretty good. Okay. Now from the user side, you is it a similar experience when you go on Airbnb or how is it more specific to the RV market? Yeah. So it's, it's very similar user experience to Airbnb. So you go on, um, you, you know, find an RV that works for you. Uh, you choose which type of, you know, uh, rental experience you want, whether you want to take the vehicle yourself or, or you want to actually have it set up. Uh, and then you, um, you know, actually put in uh, what we call a booking request. So the booking request then goes uh, to the uh, owner of the vehicle who reviews your request uh, and then says, yes, I'm happy for you to take my vehicle, approves you, and then you know you go through and, and, um, and pay for that uh, as part of that booking flow. So you pay a 25% deposit uh, to start with. And then with 30 days out from the start of the booking, that's when you pay the remainder um, to be able to get ready to go on that holiday. So is it only RVs or is it also for trailers? Because trailers, there you, you go. Yeah, it's both. It's, it's RVs and trailers. And in, okay. in Australia, we have way more trailers than we have RVs. So uh, we actually started as trailers only. We, that's all we did to start. Really? Um, yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. and, uh, and then we sort of evolved into the RV market. Uh, but really, our speciality is trailers. Um, you know, we, we have built everything as the foundation of our business around trailers. So how does that work? I mean, can you, as a renter, can I only rent a trailer if I have the proper truck and equipment or is that also provided by the rent, the renter? Sorry, as a rentee, do I need that and the renter? Yeah, so we, we started out where you had to just, you know, go through and tell us what type of vehicle you had. 
Uh, you know, in, in Australia, for example, and, and much like the US, fastest growing segment of vehicles in market is SUVs. So, you know, lots and lots of people own pickup trucks. Um, it's very common uh, here. Um, one of the things that we require, and, and same as the US, is that um, you have to have what's called an electric brake controller fitted to your vehicle um, so that you can actually tow. Uh, what we did early days was found a provider who was actually, uh, they could provide that technology onto the trailer so that then you can control that um, remotely via, via a Bluetooth app on your phone. So it meant that your vehicle no longer actually had to have an electric brake controller. Um, so all of our vans are fitted with those so that as a, as a renter, you basically just connect it up to your uh, your tow hitch and, and the electrics and then, you know, turn the app on your phone and you can actually control it from there. So it made it a lot easier for customers. Um, but now we've actually evolved into um, having the tow vehicles on the platform as well. So, you know, if you don't have an appropriate tow vehicle, you can rent the tow vehicle plus the trailer um, through us and have that experience. Absolutely. Yeah, no, listen, I, I asked only literally just yesterday, I was going through the process with my father-in-law for the first time of, can, you know, it's super easy for him, but it's only because he has the right equipment because he's got the 16,000 pound trailer and having to make sure that it's properly connected with the, the he's got a fifth wheel. So it's, yep. it, so that's the easiest way to, to but I mean, what what's that education process like though? I mean, Cause that's hard. It, that's not easy learning how to, how to, how to tow. It, I mean, maybe not necessarily tow, but at least park <laughs> and backing it yeah. in, doing it the opposite way. Your brain is, you know, all messed up from it. So, I mean, what, what was the initial feedback when you launched as trailer only? I mean, were, I'm sure renters were nervous. I, 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 what was that like? Yeah, we had a lot of customers who had some sort of towing experience. So they towed, you know, a, a small, box trailer or a boat or horse float or you, you name it. So we had lots of those people that had some level of experience. Um, but then, you know, we also had new people as well. And so we provide sort of some education material as part of that to people that, uh, you know, how to do it. Um, you know, it can be kind of daunting the first time, but, um, you know, you get used to it pretty quickly. And, um, you know, a lot of times the owner of the vehicle will help you when you first hook it up. They'll show you how to hook it up. They'll show you, you know, walk around it with you and, and look at the areas you have to make sure that you check off. They'll give you a safety checklist as part of it so that you, you know, you can go through that every time you want to hitch up and go. Um, and they'll give you some sort of basic um, training of how to do it. So they want their vehicle to be looked after. They want to make sure you're safe and and vice versa. So, you know, we've had very, very little incidents. Um, you know, incidence rates really low. Um, and it's because sort of the owners and the hires do take care um, you know, with it being that peer-to-peer -peer, peer environment. Yeah, got it. So then how how is Campify unique and different compared to some of your peers out there? I mean, I off the top of my head, I don't know if there's any actual direct competitors that, you know, oh, we're also the, the Airbnb for RVs and, you know, uh, uh, but, uh, but I know there's definitely, you know, RV, especially up here in the States, there's, you know, there's Cruise America. Um, so, I mean, how, how does Campify differentiate itself? Yeah, so I guess on on the there's two two different types of competitors. So there's the direct peer to peer marketplace competitor, um, and then there's the traditional RV rental fleet owner. So you know if I talk about the rental fleet owner to start with, um, you know what we found is that they're very limited with the um, availability, the range, uh, the types of vehicles, the distribution, uh, etc. In that in that way. So you know from our perspective, when you book a vehicle. You know, much like Airbnb, you're booking the exact vehicle that's pictured on, on the site. You can see the reviews around that specific vehicle. You can see what's included in that vehicle, uh, what the owner's actually done to it to fit it out and have, uh, you know, a good experience for the hirer. Um, and you can actually you know, make a decision with the layout and how it's going to work for you and your family based on that exact vehicle. And you can find something in your local neighbourhood as opposed to having to, to drive around and, and get something and, um, you know, go on that that uh, process. You actually activate in your local neighbourhood, take something on holidays, bring it back to your local neighbourhood. It's, it's way easier. Um, it's also, generally speaking, a little bit cheaper. So, um, you know, you, you find that it's you know, roughly about 20% cheaper than big commercial operators. Uh, and they because they're very limited in what they charge based on uh, the uh, fleet utilisation. So if they've got 
60% already booked. The prices just kept going up and up and up. Um, you know, where, whereas our platform, it's all set by the owner. So they charge whatever they want to charge. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't get involved in, in uh, influencing their pricing. So, um, you know, from our pers perspective, it, it's a, a really competitive environment. Um, from, you know, sort of direct competitor marketplace perspective, uh, you know, there's a few other operators out there um, in other countries, uh, particularly in Europe. There's about sort of, uh, you know, around about six or seven, um, you know, operators in those markets. Uh, and uh, there's you know, probably two or three in the US. Um, you know, there's probably us and a couple of other really small ones in um, in Australia. So, and we predominantly operate in Australia, New Zealand and Europe. So, you know, we found that, um, you know, from our perspective, uh, having started out with that focus on trailers, we've actually uh, provided a really detailed approach in terms of the way that um, you know, we look at what are the needs of the two parties. So um, you know, we build our platform very specific to those user needs. And so we found that other platforms have tried to sort of scale um, and you know, provide one sort of approach and just turn it on in lots of countries. That doesn't doesn't work because there's so many different regulations around this type of experience, uh, and you have to make sure that you're compliant in you know, different countries, different states. Um, you know, there's complexities around insurances and around uh, you know how uh, you actually provide the booking, what contracts you need to provide, how the vehicle registration needs to operate, and the so different in lots and lots of different areas and it can actually affect the user flow. So we've taken on all those responsibilities and built all those things into the platform in those localities to make it just really simple and easy for both parties. And now because of that, uh, we've had really high adoption rates in, in all of those countries and, and markets. Uh, and we found that even when we go into a market where, you know, someone's got a platform operating and they've just sort of turned it on, that you know, we very quickly sort of you know, take a lot of their customers because we have that you know, specific scenarios that built into the tech. Very good. You know, you founded the company seven years ago. You now gained some market penetration. You're in three three different regions. What what was the biggest challenge? Would you say that you had to experience in order to get you just to where you are today? Definitely um, insurance. So that was the biggest complication and. Um, you know, we sit in this world that lives between vehicle, rental, and accommodation. And so getting an insurance policy that covers you for all those things is complicated. And there was nothing out there that existed when we started. So we had literally had to go and have our policy created for us and then, you know, do that again in other countries. So, um, you know, and having that right for the consumer is really important because the last thing we want to do is see... Uh, someone who has, you know, rented a vehicle through us and not be covered and, and be out of pocket. Um, so, you know, that has definitely been the biggest complex thing that we've had to create. You know, I'm, uh, don't be offended when I ask you this question, but I have to ask, you know, in terms of what's proprietary for Camplify, what's stopping Airbnb or Verbo from saying, hey, those guys are doing it. They, they got a nice little, you know, setup right there. Let's just, you know, copy paste. Let's just do it ourselves and, and blow it up. You know what? What? T tell me that. Tell me that. Yeah. Look, the complication is all around sort of uh, where a vehicle rental platform really. You know, we're not an accommodation platform, but we still have to work in line with accommodation. So, you know, Airbnb is an accommodation platform. They don't rent vehicles, and the vehicle rent that rental piece of that is so important from a safety perspective, from a, a customer experience perspective. Uh, from a verification and validation perspective. So, you know, we've really focused on how do we solve that vehicle rental piece uh, and how do we optimise for that, but then also provide the experience of accommodation. So, uh, you know, as part of that, there's insurances, there's roadside cover, there's different types of contracts, there's different types of support. Um, there's the whole baked-in part of the platform that actually looks at ID verification and making sure that the person has the right licence to be able to take that vehicle and, uh, you know, vehicle registration and you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's a very different uh, experience to what Airbnb is. I know sort of you know, Airbnb's um, uh, focus is really on being that accommodation provider 
Um, and so, you know, it, it is a, a very uh, different type of world to which, which they live in. And, okay, so take us through a little bit of the economics for, for Camplify, you know, how, assuming it's a similar model in terms of, you know, you guys take the fee for hosting the peer-to-peer market and whatnot, you know, uh, tell, tell us a little bit about that. How does it, how does that work? And how, how, if you might, don't mind me asking, the company's performed to, to, to date? Yeah, for sure. So I think, um, you know, from a revenue perspective, you now we have sort of multiple different revenue streams. So uh, the first, uh, our core revenue is all around um, our platform fees or commission or whatever, however you want to think about it. So, you know, we take a clip of the ticket from the renter and a clip of the ticket from the owner, uh, averages out to be about 20%. So we take about 20% of all those transactions. Um, we then provide uh, additional other services to our customers. So, uh, for example, the uh, the renter can uh, pay down that risk. So instead of having you know, to pay $4,000 if there's a, uh, an insurance breach and they actually have a, uh, uh, you know, they've backed the vehicle into a sign or something, uh, they can reduce that down that risk in a per day manner. So we call that um, accident excess reduction. So we have that product that we provide to the hire. Uh, to the uh, to the owner of the vehicle, uh, we provide uh, the our different levels of insurances that, that we provide to them. So they can either be casual uh, or what we call premium membership. So premium membership is like an always on uh, you know, active product that we provide to them from an insurance perspective. But we know that those individuals who uh, are looking at premium membership want more than just insurance. They're looking for uh, you know, more rentals. They're looking to be active on the platform and you know, really get their vehicle working for them. So we provide a bunch of additional marketing services for those guys. So that can range from placement on site, um, you know, optimization, uh, right through to uh, our platform even spins out their own uh, version of uh, their own website. So, you know, if they have their own sort of micro business that they're running uh, and they want to be able to promote that, they can do that um, through us. Uh, and then those bookings will come back through our booking engine. So, um, you know, we, we provide that, um, that service. Uh, then we sort of uh, range into products. So we have uh, you know, GPS trackers on a subscription basis that all of our uh, customers can uh, provide. Uh, and then we've now just um, uh, recently launched into uh, a vehicle sales platform as well. So uh, what we found is that, you know, we get the best customer engagement uh, and the best uh, booking returns uh, for us and for the owners of the vehicles when we have, you know, newer, better vehicles on platform. So, um, you know, we've started to identify that, you know, when these vehicles should be, re- you know, recycled and retired uh, and a new vehicle start to come in, and also, you know, when customers want to buy more and create more of a fleet. So we've taken that that fleet buying approach and said, okay, well, you as an individual, if you own two vehicles, you're not going to be able to get as good a deal as we can get for you. So we've negotiated with manufacturers, created a bunch of product that actually is specific to rental. Uh, and then we're able to um, actually provide an ordering system so that our customers can order those direct from manufacturer. They get built and shipped direct to the customer. So... Uh, we also take a clip of that ticket. So now there's lots of different revenue streams that we've sort of created. And it really is one of the differentiators between us and other marketplaces is that we focus so much on uh, how can we grow our revenue, but how can we also service that customer who, you know, lots of these things have been products that we've created by them saying, oh, I have a need for this. And then we find it, uh, lots of customers have the need for that and we, we build a product around it. So, you know, because of that, um, you know, we've managed to grow our take rate over time uh, and now it's sort of trending at, at roughly about sort of 28% and we're growing that every quarter um, as we get more and more uh, sort of from the customer in terms of uh, their basket size on, on either side of the um, of the equation. And, and how do you reach your target customers? I mean, obviously all digital, right? It's digital product. Um, but what are some of those customer acquisition costs? And yeah, we'd we'll love to learn more there. Yeah, so we, we are very focused on digital. Um, we have, uh, you know, from an owner's side, we, we sort of leverage both um, some traditional methods as well as um, digital, but you know, certainly from a, a higher acquisition, we, we're very focused on digital acquisition. So, um, you know, our rough um, transactional cut, if you like, so every booking that we take, we make about $320 of, the, of that booking. And we're acquiring uh, owner's, 
uh, at roughly around $200 um, and hires at about $13. So, you know, unit economics-wise, you know, we're, we're in a, a very um, you know, economical position to be in, whereas we're kind of getting that return pretty much straight away as soon as that, a person takes their first rental. Very good. And, I mean, I, I, don't, I hope this isn't too far-looking of a question, but from what you can tell us, I mean, you already you mentioned you're in Australia, New Zealand, Europe. What's what's stopping you, or do you have plans for any kind of U.S. and Canada expansion? And I'm not just saying this selfishly because I'm always looking for a low cost way in which I can take my family around, go on an awesome camping trip. But um, I mean, it's also just been, you know, I mean, I'm saying this hyperbolically, but from what I understand, it, there's a boom going on in terms there's, of, yeah, you know, especially since COVID. Um, so lo- yeah. love to hear your plans there. Yeah, so uh, absolutely, we can see sort of opportunities everywhere. Um, so right now, uh, you know, we've made that entrance into the European market, and you know, we want to make sure that we're um, you know, being one of the number one players in Europe to start with. So that's sort of where we're focused on in the immediate future. Um, you know, there's so much opportunity in the European markets. If you sort of look at um, uh, you know Germany, France, Netherlands, uh, UK, Scandinavian regions. Now, sort of all combined, that they make up uh, roughly about sort of eight to ten million RVs in those markets. So you know, it's a big market, and they're growing roughly at over twenty percent. So um, you know, lots and lots of interest in the sector. Uh, and so, from our perspective, you know, we're looking at what are the other European countries we want to get into. How do we do that? Do we do that organically or through uh, M&A activity? Um, so you know, from from our perspective, you know, Europe is is certainly. Now, one of our focuses uh, from a strategic um, you know, opportunity-wise at the moment, we still have a lot of growth to, to do in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, you know, we still have less than 1% of the RVs in market on platform. So, uh, you know, there's there's a huge amount of growth to still do uh, in, in our market. Uh, and then, you know, I think if we got to a position where we felt as though we were definitely comfortable in those markets and, and that we had, um, you know, some stability there, then, yeah, absolutely, we, we would look at the US in the future. What do investors get most confused about when you, after maybe they had a, a good talk with you or saw an investor presentation, what, what do they still get confused about when they think about Campify? Uh, I'm not so much probably confused, more just sort of have to get an understanding of the fact that, um, you know, we have this real dedication and focus on revenue. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of other marketplaces, uh, you know, they, they tend to have customers who, uh, you know, come on the marketplace to start with. They have a lot of marketplace leakage, um, and they they tend to struggle with growing take rate. Um, so, you know, it's certainly something that you know we've seen uh, with other customers, uh, other marketplaces, um, you know, throughout sort of the globe. Uh, whereas what we've done is made it uh, so easy and compelling to actually stay on platform that uh, we, we, when we have customers who want an extra day or rebooking or all that kind of stuff, it all happens through platform. We don't see anything go off platform. Uh, and because of that, combined with our real focus on you know, how do we get more revenue for the customers, but not so much focused on uh, you know, how do we take more fees, it's how do we actually help solve the problem uh, and how do we create, make it easier and, and just look at the things that these customers need and provide product and service them that means we have, have grown our revenue so much. So, you know, we've seen uh, really solid growth in terms of GTV, sort of, you know, a CAGR of a, over, over 90% in the last sort of three, four years. Uh, but revenue is growing even faster than that. So it's growing at sort of 120%. Uh, and, you know, we continue to do that. So I think that's something that investors just sort of have to get their head around that we're not the standard normal marketplace. Uh, we provide so much more to customers and we're so focused on, solving the end-to-end problem, uh, whether it be peer-to-peer or these sort of small businesses as well. So what what would you say is Camplify's thesis that if realized, you know, these are the inflection points that will lead to growth in shareholder value? Yeah, I think for us, it's about um, you know, distribution of product uh, and, and lots more fleet, really. So, you know, we've always had more demand for uh, rentals than we've had fleet on platform. And from day, day dot, you know, we had back when I started that website, you know, and we actually didn't even let customers see the vehicles. You had to go through this massive sign up process, provide us your ID, everything before you could even see what was on the platform. We still had hundreds and hundreds of customers signing up that way. 
Uh, and you know, today is the same. We have way more demand than we have fleet on platform. And we're just always constantly trying to get more and more and more fleet. So, you know, because of that, we have this strong uh, focus as a business on how we get more fleet. Uh, and, you know, fleet for us is important because it um, means it's a key driver and future predictor of where we're going as a business. So if our fleet growth is strong, our future business will be strong. And so you know, as part of that, you know, we're really focused on those metrics around building fleet uh, in market and building distribution uh, and getting to a stronger position than other our rivals and, and other uh, fleet providers. So what's the plan? I mean, how, how do we how do we continue to focus on? Uh, obviously, also, I mean, you don't you as you said, you're not so worried about on the on the rental side, but on the building the fleet side. So what what are some of the plans that are being talked about internally that, you, of course, you can publicly say and, and discuss? Yeah, well, I think you know from our perspective, we're we're really a network effect business. So uh, you, you've got to start building that brand. You've got to build trust with your customers. You've got to build case studies. Uh, you've got to show them that, you know, this works and we have them covered and, um, you know, we're there to support them uh, and that there is a case for this. And so, uh, you know, the first couple of years in market is all about doing that. And then you sort of get to this level of, you know, the flywheel starts to really go. Um, and so, you know, recently, I think last year it was in in Australia, the uh, Caravan Industry Association did a survey of new market entrants and all new market entrants, they found that, over 50% of them were considering using the sharing economy to be able to pay off their vehicle purchase. So when you talk about that in the Australian market, you're talking about Camplify. So we're having that effect and we're getting uh, now customers organically come to us regularly and we're growing that fleet uh, in a really uh, in a sustainable, manageable way. So we're seeing good fleet growth, but we're also seeing churn at really, really low levels. So our customers are coming to them, coming to us, we're looking after them and they're staying with us, which is what we want to see. Very good. All right. Now I'm going to shift to asking you some more corporate type questions, public company CEO. First one, you know, I actually haven't asked this yet, but I, I, the reason I wanted to ask you is because, you know, this is a classic tech growth story that it had you stayed private in the US probably would have, who knows what kind of crazy valuation, right? At this point. So why did you decide to go public? At, at the stage you were at? Yeah, so I think the Australian market is very different to the US. You know, there's, um, we don't have that really mature uh, VC um, backings for lots of companies. And you sort of get to a point where you're seeing good growth numbers, but um, unless you're at a really early stage, that that sort of middle stage to, is, is difficult to be able to actually get access to capital. And when you want to grow it, still grow aggressively, um, accessing capital at good valuations outside of the PE market, um, it, there's not that much you know, available in the Australian market. And we, we actually went to the US and looked at you know, the opportunity to uh, get capital uh, in the US market. What we found was that they really wanted us to be operating and running in the US. And we didn't feel like that was the right decision for the business at that, that time. We felt as though we wanted to be the biggest outside the US and then look at the US later. Uh, but we also have this desire to um, be able to grow. And we know that there's other marketplaces out there doing some good things in other markets, but not doing it as effectively as we're doing it. And that we can get more scale and we can have, we've invested in our tech platform that we can look at acquisitions as a, a key form of, of growth. So to be able to have access to capital to do those things, uh, you know, listing for us in a, in a small cap environment in, in Australia made, made perfect sense. Got it. You actually started to hit on my next question and that uh, was was about capital allocation strategy and your framework for that. You know, uh, what what is your thought process as the company exists right now? Are you looking at strategic acquisitions uh, from what you can tell us, of course? And, and then, and also how do you think about what, that potential M&A might look like and or other capital allocation strategies? Yeah, so we have actually made one acquisition already. Um, mm -hmm. So um, we've done that in the New Zealand market. It's still pending approval from regulators in that market, um, but it's uh, meant to be announced uh, very soon, that, that uh, the decision around that. And so when, when we did that, we looked at a number of different factors. So they were the leader in that market. 
um, they actually operated two platforms and they were sort of one and two and we were three. So um, from that perspective, we looked at, you know, how many vehicles they had, uh, what was the team like, how long it had taken, taken them to grow in that market, how were our growth rates in that market, what was the cost of acquisition of each particular vehicle holder in that market, and what did that market really represent for us? So we found that when we looked at the time to get to the level that they were at and the revenue return from each vehicle amongst that timeline, plus the cost of acquisition of all those vehicles, it made sense for us to look at an acquisition. And so, you know, we could very quickly say, well, this actually uh, will put us number one in that market. Uh, it'll um, enable us to look at other revenue streams as well as part of that uh, vehicle, uh, sorry, part of that um, uh, acquisition and that, that uh, uh, company. Uh, and then we can look at, uh, you know, that versus you know, what it would have been if we just did it organically. And so acquisition made sense for us in that in that regard, and we we're able to do that deal for for all script. Um, so that was a, that was a, that was a good deal, um, and um, you know it was accretive, and that's really what we look for. You know, it's got to be an accretive purchase that we can add value to, um, that is strategic in terms of the growth area for us, uh, and it, it means that we can you know get this platform that we've invested in really ramping up. Very good. I mean, is, do you feel like that's that'll be key to your growth when you're looking, continuing to grow in Europe and, and establish yourself before coming to North America or anything like that? Or do you see the opportunity to still be more, to be organic? Or is that more regionally specific when you're talking about Europe? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. So yeah. it just depends okay. on the particular country and market. Um, so, you know, where it makes sense and, you know, we can see someone who's a real leader in a market and, uh, you know, they see the value in being part of Camplify as well. And, you know, ideally we want to keep those founders who have built that brand in the business, um, then that would make sense. Um, you know, if it if we feel as though there's no one who's doing a great job in that particular market and organic works better for us, then, then we'll approach it that way as well. So it's like you're playing a game of risk, you know, you're looking to conquer uh, everything around North America and then, you know, then you're going to make your move. Uh, <laughs> so... How much, if at all, have your shareholders influenced your decision-making process? Yeah, look, I think um, not that much, really. We've had a really good um, strategy. Um, we're, we've been able to really execute on that strategy. Um, we've shown good numbers. Um, you know, we've had really good support around the strategy that we've presented. Uh, and so, you know, as part of that, you know, we're, we're just out there sort of, you know, continuing to execute and, you know, we've got a, a really great board um, that has a really good mix of, um, you know, tourism, vehicle rental, uh, ASX background. So, uh, you know, they're able to understand, you know, what the market's looking for, understand what we are as a business and kind of help me to marry those two things up. Very good. So I'm going to ask you the, you know, what does success look like in a minute? But I do want to address, you know, uh, you mentioned challenges earlier. What was, was there a time in the seven years that you've been running Camplify that you're like, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know if we're going to make it past this one. Like this is, this is, this is a hard one. And, and on top of which, you know, then how should we think about maybe what some of the downside risks might be? Yeah, look, many, many, many times. Um, so, you know, with everything from, you know, my, like most startup businesses running out of capital. So, you know, had had times there where where we had had nothing, couldn't pay any wages. Um, you know, looking around for what are we going to do next? How are we going to how are we going to do that? How are we going to you know continue to operate um, through to you know COVID was a great example. You know, when we first had uh, you know the the COVID um, experience in Australia particularly, and you know we had hard lockdowns across the entire country, so no one can travel anywhere. Everyone w wants to. Get a refund on their travel, um, so you know we're literally seeing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars going out in refunds, and nothing coming in. And so uh, I think you know from our perspective, what we are extremely good at is being a scrappy um, business, and you know we've been able to sort of operate this thing uh, on you know what many. VC-backed companies in the US would consider an absolute shoestring. Um, but uh, from our perspective, it's you know, really operationally efficient. Um, and, 
Now, that's what makes good listed companies operationally efficient, focused on metrics, focused on numbers, and the ability to uh, pivot, turn, and scale. And, and so, you know, we've been through all of those things. Uh, we've looked at how do we diversify our revenue? You know, how do we create multiple revenue streams? How do we create subscription revenue? How do we build a, a community of supporters that support the company? Um, and then what do we do from an income perspective to make sure that we have, uh, you know, a great example of, um, you know, this mix of different types of, of, of income? So, you know, an example of that, you know, we mentioned before we started this podcast that, uh, you know, Australia's just recently seen uh, some huge flooding. And so, you know, normally if we were just a tourism focused business, uh, we would see that as, you know, massive risk. And so, you know, no, no one can travel, there's floods everywhere, people stop being able to go on holidays, uh, et cetera. But in the last few years, what we've actually done is built a really solid temporary accommodation program. So, you know, we work with insurance providers, for example, so that when uh, people are in situations where uh, their house can't be accessed, but they want to stay on property to you know, rebuild or uh, provide uh, cover for their, their pets or whatever it may be, uh, we drop vehicles off and, and it becomes their, their house to stay in. And so, uh, you know, we've got contracts with lots of insurance companies that actually come to us looking for accommodation. Uh, and they're, they're long-term rentals, they're you know, stable rentals, and you know, we have this great mix of different types of revenue that comes into the business because of that. Wow, that's, I mean, that's amazing. That, that's really, wow. Uh, especially with everything that's going on right now in Australia with, with the floods, we were just talking about that, yeah. Um, it's, good to, it's good to know that folks are getting taken care of like that. Um, so I, just to, to wrap a bow on downside risk, don't worry, we're going to get to more of the success. I promise. But it sounds like the main downside risk then is just slow growth in fleet, right? That, that seems that's the main thing, it sounds like. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. I think, you know, that's the main thing. Um, obviously, you know, no one knows what's going to happen with, uh, you know, world um, events we've had the last couple of years have been, you know, it seems like one thing to another. I think from our perspective, we've thrived during that period, which is which is a really good sign. Um, but yeah, certainly from from us, we need to make sure that we're acquiring customers at, at um, uh, economic levels. And so, uh, you know, we've been able to show that you know throughout the last few years of trade, um, and we've been able to show show consistency around that. So as long as we've got both those customers coming to us, that we've got you know, good insurance products, that we've got. Uh, and a good platform that we're investing in that customer, um, then you know we've got uh, some elements of cover there, but that, that certainly would be an area of risk. Very good. All right. So then, from what you can tell us, you know, looking out, you know, let's say three to five years or however long you want to look at, what what does success look like for Campify? Yeah. So look, we, we like I mentioned before, we have so much growth to do in all these countries. Um, you know, looking at um, uh, sort of country by country. If I look at uh, New Zealand, first of all, you know, as I mentioned, we made that acquisition there. Um, we're doing uh, roughly uh, rough numbers, and don't quote me on this, but say sort of uh, one to two million in, in bookings in that country at the moment. Um, now, we see a massive opportunity in that country. Um, so in pre-COVID years, that country is really focused on inbound tourism. So you know, lots of people flying into New Zealand and, and road trips were high on their agenda. So, um, you know, we would see that the two leading fleet operators in that market uh, were doing a, an equivalent of over 150 million in bookings um, per year. So those operators have now significantly sold down their fleet as a result of not being able to have customers. So they've sold off their vehicles. As customers start to return to that market, we'll see huge demand we're now the biggest operator in that market. And so, you know, we can uh, really harness the power of, uh, you know, that peer-to-peer -peer network to be able to provide a great solution for customers. If you look at um, the Australian market, um, so we we see that, um, you know, once again, leading operators, you know, they're probably looking at somewhere circa $150, 200000000 million a year in terms of uh, bookings uh, in the Australian market. Um, same things happen. They've all sold down their fleet. They have half the fleet they had in a pre-COVID environment uh, and 
there's really strong domestic activity happening. So we're now seeing really good demand from domestic. But as international tourists start to return, you know, it's going to be even bigger in terms of that. Uh, we're now sort of bigger than all fleet operators combined in terms of our fleet in the Australian market. So, you know, there's a really good opportunity for us to uh, really see some great numbers in that market. And, you know, it's the same in Europe. It's, it's, they're all the same. There's, we've got so much growth to do in all of those individual countries that we're in, plus all the new countries we want, we want to go into. So, you know, there's really strong demand um, and we just need more and more supply on the platform. Very good. All right. Well, to close this out, uh, before I let you go here today, do you enjoy being, uh, listen, there's a difference between being, you know, the public company CEO, just private company CEO. So I ask everybody this, uh, do you enjoy being a public company CEO? It's not an easy job. And it, it's just, it's a, it, it can be very hard, but also potentially rewarding. Yeah. It, it's very different um, to, you know, being uh, a pure entrepreneur building a tech company. Um, so, um, you know, I think we've had a bit of a journey to get here and as part of that, we've built a great team. Uh, and what I'm able to do now is really just focus on the overall objective from the company's perspective, uh, and making sure my team has the tools to be able to execute on that. And then, you know, talking to shareholders, talking to investors, uh, about how we can, we deliver on those outcomes. And, you know, I think. Um, you know, looking back, I, I myself have been on this sort of journey of I just want to build this tech product through to raising capital to be able to help the business sustain itself and, and grow and execute on those things. And what I've found over time is that uh, I'm actually really good at that part um, and I'm good at strategy, uh, I'm good at building a team uh, and I'm good at working with investors and delivering the results that investors want to see. Um, so, you know, I've just sort of found that really good path for myself um, that fits into what a public company CEO does uh, and then put great people around us from a compliance, a metrics, um, you know, a measurement uh, and an execution piece that can actually do all that stuff. Uh, and, you know, I can help guide them and make sure that they're focusing on the right things. So um, I, I really do enjoy what I'm doing now. It's, it's a, a great place to be. I think that's a great place to end it. So, Justin, where with that, where can our audience go and find more information on Camplify? So, um, you know, we put lots of stuff on our Camplify.com uh, domain, uh, but we put heaps of things on LinkedIn as well. So uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can follow Camplify on LinkedIn. And we share lots of industry reports, lots of updates, um, et cetera, through there. So um, that's probably the first place to start. Very good. Well, we're there, Justin. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. Good luck. Stay safe. And I look forward to our next update. Thank you. Cheers. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast.